a couple of quick announcements. First, just a reminder that our kids' summer camp is still going on, so if you're interested, uh, you can register your kids either on the newsletter or in the office. Secondly, tomorrow at 2 p.m. here at the center, we'll be having a workshop on wills that will be conducted by our brother, Mosto Jelani, who's a lawyer in our community. For those who are interested, you can just please attend. Uh, please don't forget to move out and fill in all the gaps uh, so that we can accommodate uh, everyone, inshallah. And lastly, our imam who will be delivering the journal clip for today is uh, the imam Dwight. Thank you very much for your time. That's all time. Thank you. Thank الحمد لله 
نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير واشهد ان سيدنا وحبيبنا وقائدنا ومعلمنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا اما بعد يا معشر الاحباب all praise is due to allah we seek his guidance his forgiveness his mercy his assistance we seek refuge in allah from the evil within ourselves and from the evil of our actions whomsoever allah guides there is no one to lead astray and whomsoever allah leads astray there is no one to guide him i bear witness there is no one worthy of worship except allah and i bear witness that muhammad is his servant and his messenger may the peace and blessings of allah be upon him upon his family his companions and all those who follow them until the last day O you who believe, revere Allah as He should be revered and do not die except in a state of surrender. Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, in previous khutbas, I began a challenging and difficult series of khutbas related to domestic violence. And I want to continue this series today with the third khutbah, in terms of understanding the various forms of domestic violence that exist within our households. And the first step we had already spoken about in terms of understanding the honor and dignity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accorded to the human being. That that's the first step in being able to stop this matter in taking place within our houses. In the second khutbah, I had addressed how it is that we are to establish and maintain healthy relationships based on the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of our Messenger However, part of preventing this issue from existing or taking place within our homes is to understand how it manifests itself in many different forms. There are many different forms in which it manifests itself. And so when we become more aware of its presence and how we can change our behaviors to stop it, then this is one of the preventative means that we must take in order to deal with this matter. Now for the most part, people usually associate domestic violence with physical abuse. That is the common and most uh, thought of form uh, of, physical, uh, of domestic violence, which is actually the, the physical. But we have to understand that there's much more to it than that. When we talk about the physical abuse, out of all of the domestic violence cases, this represents about 10% of them. Only 10% of domestic violence that occurs in households is physical abuse. Now, of course, we understand that's 10% uh, too much, that it should be uh, zero. But it's the other forms of domestic abuse that account for more than 50%. That when it occurs and takes place within Muslim homes, when we talked about the statistics in our first khutbah, and we said that over 50% of Muslim households have some form of domestic violence where people have experienced it in one way or another. Only 10% of them are actually the physical. So this form of abuse manifests itself in many ways. 
whether it be in terms of including but not limited to, whether it's hitting or pushing or kicking or pulling hair or shoving or slapping or twisting one's arms, all of these different forms, throwing down, etc. These are all forms of, of domestic uh, uh, abuse or, or violence. Now, it can also include physical forms of threatening or intimidation. So if you get in somebody's face and you're very close to them, or if you block them from trying to leave in a doorway or something of that sort, and that physical presence, that is also considered as a form of, of physical abuse. Now, whenever we're talking about abuse, this is something very important to understand. We are not talking about isolated incidences. What does that mean? It means that if it occurs one time, that a person were to you know, get angry, lose control, and they do it once, if it occurs one time as a single incident, clearly it's not acceptable, and that behavior needs to be dealt with because it is destructive and it is harmful. But if it occurs one time, it's not considered as abuse, domestic abuse per se. It has to be a pattern of behaviors. It has to be a pattern of behaviors in which a person is trying to intimidate or to control someone else through these actions and through these behaviors. That is when it becomes abuse. That is when it is considered as domestic uh, abuse. And so when such behaviors are used to intimidate or control somebody, then it falls under that category. But if it happens one time, we're not condoning it. It has to be condemned. But it's different than if it is happening on a continuous basis or it happens to be a pattern of behavior. Let's be clear about this from the Islamic perspective. None of these forms are acceptable. None of them. With, under any circumstance, in a marital relationship or in a family household. None of these forms are acceptable whatsoever. When we're looking at the sunnah of our Prophet Wasallam, what was the way of our Prophet Wasallam in this regard? We have a narration from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Qalat, مَا بَرَبَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِيَدِهِ خَادِمًا لَهُ قَطْ وَلَمْ رَأَةً لَهُ قَطْ وَلَا ضَرَبَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِيَدِهِ شَيْئًا قَطْ إِلَّا أَنْ يُجَاهِدَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ This is a hadith that is narrated by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad. It's a Sahih hadith. That Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrated, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa never hit any of his servants at all. Not once. Nor did he ever hit a woman that was a part of his household, any of his wives. Not once. Nor did he hit anything with his hand. Shay. He never hit anything with his hand, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at all. Qat. Except that when he went to struggle or to fight fi sabil Allah, for the, the expeditions, the military expeditions that he went on, that was the only exception in which the Prophet ﷺ would use any form of, of physical uh, hitting. That was it. But this hadith is very telling. Because when the Prophet ﷺ says he didn't hit anything, وسلم, meaning he would not slam his hand on a table or hit a door or bang a wall or anything of that sort. He never hit anything with his hand وسلم, at all. So that is to make it clear. This is the way of our Messenger Now when it comes to the, the, the family members within the house, the Prophet وسلم, he said in his khutbah during Hajj, the very famous khutbah al-wada, in which he had 124,000 Sahaba who were with him and they're listening to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What was one of his counsels that he gave to the Ummah? Not just to the Sahaba who were listening to them, to him at the time, but to the Ummah. The Prophet Sallallahu told us, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ فِي النِّسَاءِ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ فِي النِّسَاءِ 
فَإِنَّكُمْ أَخَذْتُمُوهُنَّ بِأَمَانِ اللَّهِ وَفِي رِوَايَ فَإِنَّهُنَّ عِنْدَكُمْ عَوَانِ That the Prophet ﷺ, he said, have fear, have taqwa, have consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding your women, regarding your wives. Because they have been, you have taken them as a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you have taken them as a trust. It's an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, because they are your helpers. That they are helpers within your household. So fear Allah, have awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding them. Abdullah ibn Zam'a radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrated, عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يجلد أحدكم رأتفه جلد العبد ثم يجامعها في آخر اليوم So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, this is a hadith narrated in Sahih Bukhari that he said none of you should flog your spouses or your wife as he would flog a slave and then go to sleep with her at night have intimate relations with her at the last part of the day or at the end of the day. Now this is hadith not to say that it's okay to flog the servant. The Prophet ﷺ is not meaning that it's okay to flog the servant. But that act in and of itself when a servant is flogged and the Prophet ﷺ, he is condemning, he is saying, don't do that to your spouse during the day and then go to her at night. Because this is a complete injustice. It, it, it's, it's, it's a contradiction in terms of how you treat them during the day and then you take your right from her as such at night, as if she, she's somebody that is, is a, you know, uh, an animal or less than an animal. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said this explicitly in another hadith. And he questioned it. He said, بِمَا يَضْرِبُ أَحَدُكُمْ امْرَأَتَهُ ضَرْبَ الْفَحْلِ so the Prophet ﷺ, he said, How does any one of you strike or beat his spouse or his wife as he beats the camel, the male camel, the stallion camel, and then he goes and embraces her at night, and then he goes and he sleeps with her? This is something that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, How can you do that? How could somebody actually do that? Where they treat them as such, and then they go to them at night in this manner. And this leads to another form of abuse, which is very sensitive, and it's very taboo to speak about this within our community, but it exists, and we need to deal with it, and we need to speak about it very clearly. And this is sexual abuse. We think that this is not something that can exist in a marital relationship, but it can. When we're looking at conjugal rights within a marriage, this is part of establishing a relationship, a sense of romance, a sense of uns, intimacy, that helps to strengthen the marital bond. That's what conjugal rights are for. It's not just for satisfying the physical shahwa or the desire, but there's a much deeper meaning to that act within our faith tradition. And so, when this is forced upon a spouse, when it becomes something that is forced upon another, or it's used as a tool for material gain. Oh, you want this? But if you don't give me this, then you can't have it. We hear that. That sometimes it's used as a bargaining tool by one partner within the relationship to say you're not going to get any of it until you do this or you do that. This is not the proper way. Or if one forces it upon another. And so if there are intimacy issues within a marital relationship, they need to be resolved. No question about it. And they can be resolved. But under no circumstance should any form of intimacy be forced onto a spouse. There is no coercion in this matter whatsoever. And in a future khutbah, inshallah, I'm going to actually dedicate one khutbah just to look 
at the verses of the Quran and a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that are misused, that are misinterpreted for the sake of a person justifying their actions of abuse, whether they're physical, whether they're sexual, whether they're otherwise. And I'm going to dedicate an entire khutbah just on looking at some of these traditions and how they need to be properly understood and so that we understand there is literally zero tolerance for any of these forms. There is no room whatsoever for any of this within our faith tradition. Another thing that can lead to sexual abuse within a relationship is the use of pornography. Again, another very sensitive matter, but it has to be addressed. Don't think that this is something that is to be taken lightly. And it does exist within marital households. This is something that is completely and absolutely prohibited in any way, shape, or form, even among consenting spouses. A fahisha is a fahisha is a fahisha. It is prohibited unequivocally, without any difference of opinion. It is not permitted whatsoever. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Say to the believing men, lower their gaze, guard their chastity. This is pure for them. Allah is aware of what they do. وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنْ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا And tell the believing women to lower their gaze and to guard their chastity and not to reveal their adornments except what appears, what normally usually appears. So we understand this matter, it leads to breakdowns in marriages. It can lead to feelings of betrayal between spouses. That if one partner has an addiction to this issue, to pornography, and they're looking at what is haram for the sake of trying to get some sort of satisfaction within their marital relationship. This can actually lead to a sense of betrayal. This can lead to a sense of inadequacy. Oh, you're not good enough. This can lead to a person getting low self-esteem from the spouse because they feel that I have naqs, I have deficiencies, and therefore my spouse is seeking this elsewhere. It's a betrayal, and it's haram, unequivocally. And this leads to another form of abuse, which is emotional abuse. There are forms of emotional, emotional abuse, they include, but aren't limited to, belittling, insulting, Calling one's wife an unfit woman or mother, or calling one husband that he is saying to him he's not man enough. Making fun of the spouse, calling them names, etc. The Quran is very clear in this regard. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhum. وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِّن نِسَاءٍ عَسَىٰ أَن يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُنْ وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ بِئْسَ اسْمُ الْفُسُوقُ بَعْدَ الْإِيمَانِ بِئْسَ لِسْمُ الْفُسُوقُ بَعْدَ الْإِيمَانِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُبْ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Allah tells us and an address to all believers. O oh, believers, don't let some men ridicule others, make fun of others. They may be better than them. Don't let some women ridicule other women because they may be better than them. Don't defame one another. Don't call one another by offensive nicknames. How evil it is to act rebelliously after having faith. And whoever does not repent, then indeed they are wrongdoers. They are moon, they are oppressors. So this verse is telling us, be careful with what you say. Be careful of how you speak to one another. Now if this is applying to 
general men and women, how much more so do these apply within our households, towards our spouses, towards our children, towards our parents? How much more does this apply and these prohibitions? Not to ridicule, not to say bad words, not to, to insult, not to call names. And so the causes of emotional abuse, when a person, they end up feeling that they're, they're being abused or taken advantage of, and they feel a sense of intimidation, they feel a sense that they're trying to be controlled or whatnot. This leads to another very common form of abuse, which is the verbal. They're related to one another. Don't think that what you say doesn't have an impact. You want to talk about the most common form of domestic abuse within our households? It's what we say. It's what we say. 80% of the cases of domestic abuse are related to the top. Nearly 80% of cases of domestic abuse are related to what we say and making fun or speaking things. This includes swearing, this includes yelling, this includes screaming at, continuously arguing, talking over you, using threatening or intimidating language. All of these things, even just the physical form of when you yell at somebody and it's constant, screaming at them, right? This is a form of, it can be seen as a form of abuse. If a person makes threats, if you don't do this, then I'm going to divorce you. Or I'm going to marry another woman. And this actually leads to another form of abuse, which we'll talk about in another khutbah. Or it could lead to making false accusations against one's spouse. All of these are prohibited. There's no question about it. What's it based on? What you say. It's based on the tongue. The Prophet ﷺ, he described the believer. And he described what the believer is not. An Abdullah, an Nabi ﷺ قال, لَيْسَ الْمُؤْمِنُ بِالطَّعَانِ وَلَا اللَّعَانِ وَلَا الْفَاحِشِ وَلَا الْبَدِيِّ تَقَدَّمُ يَا أَخْوَانِ يَرْحَمُكُمُ اللَّهِ افْسَحُ وَيَفْسَحُ لَهَا لَكُمْ Please make, uh, move forward and make room for your brothers. We, we have many people here today. Try to fill in the gaps. Move towards uh, your uh, left side. Move forward any spaces that you have. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said the believer is not, and he listed four things. He is not ta'an, laysa bit ta'an. Meaning that he doesn't taunt or he doesn't insult the honor of others. And he is not somebody who curses. He is not somebody who curses. He is not somebody that is abusive. Because fahish can mean in terms of what one says or what one does. And so they're not abusive. And they're not foul. They don't speak things that are indecent. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, this is not a believer. And so all of these things can easily emanate or they can come out on our tongues. And so any form of causing fear or intimidation towards someone within the household for the sake of controlling them, this is Abuse, whether it's through what you say or whether it's through what you do. And the Prophet ﷺ explicitly prohibited us from instilling fear within another Muslim's heart. It's prohibited. There's a story that is mentioned in the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawud that Abdurrahman ibn Abu Layla, he said that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they, they were once traveling with the Prophet ﷺ. And so one of them slept. Another companion came, and the Sahaba who was sleeping, he had a rope with him. And so all the Sahaba did was just, I'm going to play a joke, I'm going to take this rope away from this companion. The companion wakes up, he finds that his rope is gone, and it, he causes him fear. Where did it go? What happened? Right? And so then when the Prophet ﷺ, he heard this, he said, لا يحل لي مسلم أن يروي مسلما لا يحل لمسلم أن يروع مسلما. He said that it is not for a Muslim. It is prohibited. لا يحل. It is not permitted for a Muslim to frighten another Muslim. You are not allowed to instill fear into the heart of another Muslim. And so if this is again in general towards Muslims, how much more does this apply to members of our household? 
our spouses or our children or our parents. It's impermissible. Another form of abuse, economic abuse. If this includes refusing one's wife to get an education or to work, if she chooses to with a legitimate reason. If she has a legitimate reason or, or you prevent her from not doing this because, uh, without a legitimate reason, right? And then in other words, the type of work is lawful, etc. Or you take her wealth forcefully. That whatever she gets, then you end up using it or spending it. Or you withhold from her wealth that is lawful. Or you don't spend on her properly. All of these are forms of economic abuse. We have to be careful. We have to be vigilant. I don't have time to go into the other forms of abuse in detail. Whether they are neglect, using isolation, or controlling or minimizing others' wrong actions. If somebody does something wrong and they minimize it or they deny it, or they use somebody's uh, immigration status to coerce them to do something. Oh, if you don't do this, I'm going to send you back to where you came from, right? We've heard this threat and it's being used now, unfortunately. Well, it is being used sometimes within our own households. There's also spiritual abuse. And this is one of the most dangerous forms of abuse where a person is using religion. And that is something that I will detail in, the next, in another khutbah because it's something that is so important. But that's the most dangerous form of abuse because it is related to a person's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very dangerous. There's also psychological abuse. And so, when I'm going to be speaking on the impacts of domestic violence on households, then I'll be able to address these forms of abuse, the spiritual and the psychological. Only when we become aware of the various forms of abuse and domestic violence that can exist within our households, can we begin to take steps to stop them or to prevent them from occurring? Nasallallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala al-'afwa wal-'afiyah. Nasallallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala an yatub alayna jami'an. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-'azim li wa lakum li sa'il muslimin min kulli dhanb. Fastaghfiru innahu ghafurur rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك يا ربنا سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين اللهم ارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين واشف مرضانا ومرض المسلمين وانصر إخواننا المستضعفين المظلومين في كل مكان انصرهم في مشارق الأرض وفي مغاربها يا رب العالمين